what happens when um, recurring UTIs get out of hand and become what I call little monsters. This is our the nightmare things that I dream about. Um, my disclosure is I'm an ID physician, so I always say no to drugs, like you say no to drugs, um, trying to do, but you know, it, we, we work very closely uh, between uh, my, our urologist and, and the ID in order to help them and help each other um, work through this resistance um, epidemic that we have. So we'll talk about some types of resistant bacteria, mostly gram negatives, kind of the epidemiology and some strategies that we can use. So in order to set that, this is your typical patient. You have a 42 paraplegic man, presents to the hospital ED with lethargy, fever, anxiety, flank pain, and alter mental status. Kind of, you know, um, kind of a common bread and butter that we could see as part of our recurring UTIs. And when you look at it, the types of infections that we mostly see in our hospitals are gonna be catheter-associated UTIs, uh, followed by um, either surgical wound infections or catheter-associated uh, bloodstream infections. So in this patient, um, obviously doesn't have um, a catheter line, doesn't have a recent infection, so then you have to go, is he have an indwelling catheter or is self-cathing? And because he has a neurogenic bladder, he's going to have continuous bacteria that are going to cause some UTI um, issue. But you, the, the reflex in the ER is always to blame the, the urine instead of looking for other causes. So this is to remind that there's other causes to this. So as we get through the, the, the history, he's, been he's come several times to the ED. Um, he's not very good at following up with his urologist or even his primary. And he has had several UTIs that are being treated. He also has some recurrent pneumonias and has received several antibiotics part. And just like Dr. Kim mentioned, we looked at his past medical urine cultures and found that there was a lot of fluoroquinolone resistant E. coli and had some ESBL producing and had already been treated twice with meropenem. So it's already setting up when we come and saying, well, the history, what are we going to do with this patient? Is, is it going to be enough just to treat or do we need to um, see what else is going on? So uh, we mostly see uh, in the complicated UTIs, uh, we're going to have what we call uropathogenic E. coli. Um, uropathogenic E. coli, uh, one of our faculties in, um, at, at Baylor, Dr. Barbara Troner, has done her career looking at this, and it has to do uh, that um, it has to do with the uh, pili and how the E. coli actually works. So if we look at this indwelling catheters, immunosuppression, and antibiotic exposures are going to do what is our complications, and then uncomplicated, we're going to find it more in a female in a female gender and older age. So. We further into the case, we looked at that he is a little more altered. He has kind of a systemic inflammatory response, and some of the tests were done. And, you know, we see there's a white count of 13,000. His creatinine is up. And this is after being seen in the ER. The ER does the usual vancosocin or vancocephepime without any further um, investigation. So, when we look at his, uh, when we look at this uh, UPEC or uropathogenic E. coli, what it is interesting um, is that the UPEC with this little pilite or fimbri actually comes in and just kind of lives in this transition cell of the bladder, and it then just kind of lays dormant. And there has been um, part that if you actually um, inject other type of friendly E. coli, you can actually displace it. There's a whole thing uh, working now looking at bacteriophages as a way of displacing the E. coli from this, this transition cell and this epithelium so it doesn't affect. So when we look further into it, we see that the, it has an attachment, there's an invasion, then it kind of just, kind of this intracellular reservoir that we have there, and it just continues to be an issue. And then when you put a catheter and in indwelling, actually the little bacteria decides to attach and then forms this biofilm, um, as we saw from Dr. Kim. 
Um, and so the, the biofilm for us in infectious disease is like a little shield for bacteria. So we give antibiotic and then this, and the antibiotics don't penetrate the shield. And then inside here, the E. coli just becomes more resistant. Our, our E. coli are just in general bacteria are very social and they like to share everything. They're not, they're not very greedy and once they have something that have resistance, they'll transmit it through plasmids um, through each other and then becomes um, an, an issue. So what we're dealing is, is with the, you know, so we'll have this biofilm. So you can see this forming in the urinary catheter, but the other part is looking at a stone. And the stone, I imagine, like a little coral that has this biofilm where it just serves as a nice nidus of infection and protection for our bacteria. So when we look at the resistance and pathogens, when you look at long-term care, you'll see that we get a lot of e ESBL because what happened in long-term care, especially they'll have an elderly, they'll do kind of a, what I call the knee-jerk reflex. They, they get a urine culture, there's no UA, uh, maybe uh, as Dr. Kim explained, there's no perianal hygiene and they just get treated. And then eventually if they, they produce little uh, monsters which are quinolone resistance, bacterium resistance, and and then we continue to have aminoglucosides and then multidrug resistance. So one of the part is trying to actually educate the, the primary cares or even the doctors that go to um, the long-term facilities or the nursing homes that not everything that is altermental status in a geriatric patient is a UTI. There's other consequences. So when we look at our uh, mechanisms as they decide, you have the little plasmid that has the information and it's just gonna transmit it to the difference. Either gonna have resistance to your beta-lactams, you're gonna have resistance to your polymyxins. We have an overexpression of efflux, meaning that the bacteria, you know, they come in and they come out immediately. There's modifications in aminoglucosides and then of course the quinolones. And once you experience, um, usually we see the pattern that they'll have first uh, trimetropine sulfa resistance, the second pattern will be resistance to ciprofloxacin or the fluoroquinolones, and the third pattern is that they eventually become ESBLs, and then as over the use of, uh, of the carbapenem, then we create what we call the carbapenemonase. So there's like a four-way step process on, on the resistance patterns. And that's what we see globally. We see see this, the gram negatives, we see a lot of fluoroquinolones. So for example, patients coming from Latin America will already experience. So just Mexico has a 45 to 55% fluoroquinolone. But the problem is, is that then you will have to use a carbapenem. But you also have ceftraxone, which is mostly used in Southeast Asia. But the ones that we worry about are the carbapenem. So patients that already come from this area of the world will already have a carbapenem. And here highlighted is, is Greece, which is kind of the kind of the sentinel, the canary on the coal mine that tells us what types of production, since this was the first place where we saw our antibiotic resistance happen. So, um, you know, so we have guidelines. These guidelines are being currently updated um, throughout, and it's actually going to include a whole part on what to do with transplant patients. But the guidelines are, are helping to guide, and it's also, as, 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 as we heard, they are not universal throughout the different um, in, um, specialties. So one of the part of this is looking at asymptomatic bacteria. Who should we have selected? Um, this was an in infectious disease in clinical North America by Dr. Penfield and one of our fellows, Dr. Cortez, um, looking who gets them, how are they being done, who has an indwelling catheter. And then they, out of that, they came out and did an algorithm on how to possibly treat uh, and, and, um, asymptomatic bacteria, possible probable definite UTI. And the idea is that this is disseminated throughout. Um, so one of the things that we're starting to do using the electronic medical record is that you cannot order a urine culture without a urine analysis. So people have to read about the urine analysis in, on, unless there's special circumstances. But what we wanna do is, do they have actually pyuria? Do they actually, does, does it make sense? Does, if it has a lot of epithelial cells, that is not a good sample. So what we're actually growing in the urine culture is just colonized perianal area and must not be treated. So it's trying to understand that and then looking at the symptoms and then looking if it needs 
And the other part is that we're heading toward less is better. This is not where more is better, less is better, less days of treatment for UTIs, less treatment of antibiotics, because we've seen that this decreases the pressure it does on our gut and continuing to have resistant bacteria. So what happens when you actually have that? So if you have for multi-drug resistance, we love using phosphomycin. Phosphomycin is great. We use it a lot. We use also nitrofurantoin, but today I was reading that nitrofurantoin's price just went 400%. So now nitrofurantoin is gonna be very expensive. And now we're gonna have to do more, I guess, insurance uh, approvals and things like that. But second lines are the quinolones. They are not the first lines, and this is something that has to be emphasized. Um, there are some institutions where quinolones are restricted because of the due added resistance pattern. Now, if you have complicated MDR, I, I do advise that you call one of your friendly IDs um, because most of them, we don't have carbapenems that come in an oral form. They will need IV therapy. So will you use something like um, the carbapenems, especially if we know the MC producers? The piperacillin tazobactam is an interesting alternative, but um, we tend to use it less because now we're seeing that the patterns that we have in ESBL, even though it says S susceptible, might not be as a good choice. And then look at the combination therapy. So I get a text one day. I usually get lots of texts, but this is a text from, and it's, um, and let's say it's not a Friday afternoon, it's like a Wednesday afternoon. This is the text. This is a 67-year-old woman that they, the, my, one of my, Dr. Meyer sent me this, and he's like, look, what do you think? And I'm like, okay, uh, not good. And then he sends me this. So, so what should we do now? So this is a culture that is growing a Klebsiella, and it is says sensitive to augmentin, which we don't believe. Uh, sensitive to imipenem and sensitive to tetracyclines, that would be doxyminocycline and tegacycline, which don't penetrate very well into the urine. So in this case, um, th this lady has a very urological complication, and she has recurrent stones that we, they've been treating, but this patient had been out in the community before it landed in um, Dr. Meyer's uh, hand. And so the idea is, what do we do with the stones that are here and the stones that have formed this little monster of Klebsiella? So the first thing that, that we do is, one is, is how, how is the patient? The patient was stable, so we didn't have to rush and treat, but he's like, well, now I have to do surgery because I have to figure out how to get this and reconstruct it. And he went on and, and explained me the whole surgery and said, well, let, let me see. Um, so what we do is that we send our isolate to get tested. So we tested for the newer antibiotics we have. So in this, for example, in, in this report, what is not highlighted here is the aminoglucosides. So I asked for aminoglucoside susceptibilities as well as the avibactin, the ceftacity avibactin, as, and um, avicas and ceftosolone, um, cerbaxa to see if I can use those. And I also, um, this is Klebsiella, so another combination therapy that we use sometimes is using two double carbapenems because um, when you use the ertapenem, you defeat the the cell wall and then use the meropenem to actually treat the infection. So we can see that on a, on a Hodge test. So we look at this, and so I asked them for different uh, susceptibilities, including cefepime, um, to see if I can overcome the concentration. We test newer antibiotics and these combinations. And in this patient, what we're gonna do is that she is susceptible to the avicast, and so we're gonna do a combination of at uh, the time of surgery. She'll come in uh, 48 hours, we'll do avicast and amicacin, and um, continue that, and hopefully, um, we won't have uh, a sepsis afterwards. But it's a complicated case because of the type of bacteria that already has mutated by the time we saw. So we do the future treatments. We do, we have ceftacidine avibactin. We have cestocillin tazobactam. Those are um, available, get very good levels into the urine. We're using the carbapenems. There's a couple ones coming up, including one called meropenem uh, vasobactin um, that is available. 
Um, there is a new aminoglucoside called plasomycin, which is already available in the market that has a little bit better activity against gram-negative, and I use this when I have amicacin resistance. The tetracyclines really don't get into the urine at all, so we don't use those in, our, in this part. And there's some novel agents coming down that we can use um, together. So what we're looking at the future is uh, more is no better, so less day of treatments. Minimize the antibiotics by targeting specific an, an pathogen. Actually looking at the urinalysis. Consider combination therapy when we have these complicated urological changes. Then the other thing is what we call changing the landscape. And so is use of pre and probiotics. There's ongoing trials for these. And then there are case reports of using fecal transplants. So we use fecal transplants for C. diff, but we also, there is case reports where we have multidrug resistant bacteria. We use friendly um, uh, donors of, of bacteria in order to change the bacteria that is in our gut and have had some successful. And then music, which is what is done in Michigan, where they identified um, um, these ones were done for prostate biopsies, where we they have a high dose of quinolones, and it's the same thing as we talked about before, is, uh, is target therapy to that. So there are lots of sunsets ahead, and uh, there is a lot of new things going on, but in order to curb the antibiotic um, resistance, is, it is an um, integral approach between the urologist and the ID specialist and the infection control in order to curb down some of this resistance. Thank you.